Just put it. Hello? Mm -hmm. So if it's this view, if it's this view. Well, actually, this could be helpful to use to put my paper on. Yeah, sure. Uh, no, no, just Okay, I'll sit, I'll sit there, though. Yeah. Because it's hard to lean forward to look at my paper. I think this will be better. Isn't it? Okay, I think we should begin, huh? <laughs> um, welcome, everyone. Um, this week, um, we have Matthew Gampert, who teaches at the Department of Western Literatures and Languages uh, at Boazici University. Uh, I actually um, uh, knew Matthew when I was uh, at Bilkent University. He used to uh, be the head of the uh, Civilizations, Cultures, Ideas program, right? So, sure. Civilizations, Cultures, Ideas. I already forgot because you were, can't remember things. Me too. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> uh, and then he worked at Kadir Haas University, uh, American Literature, Department of American Literature, and he's now recently moved to Boazici University, as I said, Department of Western Languages and Literatures. Uh, Matthew's field is actually classicism and comparative literature between the two. Classical um, influences, you could say. Yes. And his, uh, his first book is um, Grafting Helen, The Abduction of the Classical Past. And his forthcoming book uh, is going to be from the BG University BG Press, University is that right? Press. Uh, the End of Meaning, Studies in Catastrophe. I'm really curious about this next one. Uh, he's, uh, he has uh, published many articles, Matthew, and uh, uh, in, in um, mostly um, journals of um, literature, classicism, and comparative literature. He has published um, in, on tragedy in modern era, the sense of tragedy and genre of tragedy in modern era in Contemporary Theory Review. He's also published an early um, French poetry. Early Is modern, that right? Early modern. Early modern French poetry. French poetry. In, um, in French form. Uh, he, one of the, many of you actually might know him from a, a very fine article that he published in a, a collection whose title escapes me now, uh, a collection by Murat Berge and Jale Parla on nationalism and the Balkans, or uh, something like that, uh, on Atatürk statues. And um, the title of his talk today is Impossible Parthenon, Turkish Classicism at Anatkabir. So he's been working on this kind of stuff for some time, I guess. OK, Thank you. Matthew Gampert. Thank you. Thank you. Is this working? Can you hear me? Yes? yes. Very good. Uh, well, first, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Mahmoud. Thank you to. Uh, Professor Mahmoud Mutman for inviting me, and, uh, and thank you to Shahir University. It's a pleasure to be part of the uh, Cultural Studies uh, talk series, and a, a, a very nice poster, by the way, so uh, lovely job. Uh, there will be no, Im I'm not using any images at all for this talk, and that partly is, it's mostly because of a, a, 
a, um, a phobia and, and deep-seated uh, loathing that I have for PowerPoint presentations. Uh, I, I figure that most of us know what Anut Kabir looks like. And um, in any case, uh, I will do my best, as I said, to uh, weave, weave images with my words. So uh, hopefully you won't, we won't suffer too much from, uh, from uh, a lack of images. So uh, let me begin. It's not difficult to understand why this shrine to secular nationalism, Anut Kabir, stands as one of modern Turkey's most sacred venues. What is less immediately intelligible is why it should have been designed in part to resemble a classical temple. I will argue that classicism functions at Anut Kabir as a totalitarian mechanism for imagining a utopian future, the future that is of a modern nation. If Turkey can remember itself as a classical culture, and if classicism itself is an autochthonous phenomenon, then Turkey, at least so the logic goes, has been part of Europe all along. From its very inception, the construction of the Turkish nation state depended, of course, as we know, on an idea of modernization, inseparable from westernization. Modernization meant catching up to the West and leaving the past, or certain pasts behind. If this meant the adoption of amnesia as state policy, it was a very selective form of amnesia. By recasting the move towards an indefinite future as the return to a definitive past, a rediscovered primal origin, or what Benjamin will call in Fourier or the Arcades an Urgeschichte, right, an Ur past, a, a Ur, uh, a, a primordial origin, other by doing this, other competing pasts are forgotten, along with the mandate to forget them. The role of public monuments is crucial in this amnesic program. Monuments are supposed to commemorate the past, but Anut Kabir suggests that their real purpose is to make us forget. The designs of the 49 projects entered in the 1942 competition for Atatürk's mausoleum all suggest the effort to tie Turkish nationalism to various privileged pasts by way of emblematic architectural forms, be they pyramids, Egypto-Hittite temples, Hittite temples, Roman pantheons, Seljuk tombs, and mausolea in the Central Asian Turkic style. But it is the classical temple that prevails over its competitors as signifier of modernity, a proposition that, in the text of the winning proposal submitted by architects Emin Onat and Orhan Arda, rests on a reflexive association of the classical and the rational. And this is from the proposal by Onat and Arda. Our past, they say, in translation, like that of all Mediterranean civilizations, goes back thousands of years. It starts with Sumerians and Hittites and merges with the life of many civilizations from Central Asia to the depths of Europe, thus forming one of the main roots of the classical heritage. Atatürk, rescuing us from the Middle Ages, widened our horizons and showed us that our real history resides not in the Middle Ages, but in the common sources of the classical world. In the monument for the leader of our revolution and our savior from the Middle Ages, we wanted to reflect this new consciousness, hence we decided to construct our design philosophy along the rational lines of a 7,000-year-old classical civilization, rather than associating it with the tomb of a sultan or a saint." End of that quotation. To the extent, then, that post-classical history is a retreat from the rational, it is not really history at all in this conception. And so, 2,000 years of Byzantine, Seljuk, and Ottoman culture become a Middle Ages, as they put it, no longer part of history, but a parenthesis therein. To build in the classical style, then, is a way of suturing past to present. It is the sign that history has resumed its rational course. But this is classicism, let us not forget, in the service of a modern Turkish identity, an identity that must be seen as simultaneously part of and distinct from the West. The obvious strategy is to turn the West itself into a Turkish invention. Onat and Arda do something like that by understanding classicism simultaneously as something foreign and autochthonous, heterogeneous and homogeneous, hybridity dissolved within the solvent 
of what they call the classical heritage as something simple and self-evident. Turkey itself would appear to be subsumed within this larger heritage, a civilization, as they call it, that, be, that, that can be termed classical. But at the moment, a distinctive Turkishness seems to be in danger of disappearing within this larger classicism. It reasserts itself. For in Onat and Arda's scheme, Turkish culture is prior to that of which it is a part, forming, as they put it, one of the main roots of the classical heritage. So if the classical is a totalizing, tautologi tautological excuse me, entity, it is also a Turkish one. The force which binds the different roots of this classical heritage is Turkishness itself, that past which is our past, as they put it. Thus, for Onat and Arda, not only is the Turkish necessarily the classical, the, classic is necessarily, the classical is necessarily the Turkish. Similar strategies are visible, as we know, in a generation of Turkish writers from Sabahattin Eubolu to Azra Erhat, who sought to rewrite classicism as a Turkish phenomenon. Just one example, uh, Halakarnas Balukçası, for example, in Anadolu Tanrıları from 1955, argues that uh, Homeric Greek is an Anatolian language and Homer, and therefore, an Anatolian poet. We might compare such efforts as these to those in Greece itself for fashioning what is sometimes called a neo-Hellenic identity based in an unbroken continuity with the classical past. It's not as easy as one might think, for here, too, the West keeps getting in the way. Neo-Hellenism, as my friend Vangelis Kalotikos puts it in his Modern Greece, Neo-Hellenism is necessarily a discourse of absence, as he puts it, a discourse of absence. The modern Greek is condemned to find his identity somewhere else, in Europe and its many Hellenisms. Greek modernity, Kalotikos argues, and this is a quote, is crowded out by such imaginings, unquote. The poet George Seferis imagines a Greece faced with a past that has been, in essence, stolen from it. In the face of the tradition of Western Hellenism, how, Kalotikos asks, was a Greek to, as he puts it, extrapolate? How was the Greek to extrapolate what he calls a Greek Hellenism? How we, well then, how we are asking here was the Turk to extrapolate a Turkish Hellenism. Anut Kabir shows us how. The site itself on the heights of Anatepe is strategically situated, of course, affording exemplary visibility and also exemplary symbolic possibilities. The mausoleum becomes instantly a landmark, a point of reference, and one that stands, we might add, in dialectical opposition to the ancient citadel crowning the heights of Ulus. As an architectural complex, Anut Kabir, not just the mausoleum, but all of its associated buildings and the area itself, is defined above all by way of two perpendicular axes, the main processional alley, which runs north uh, west to southeast, which as uh, architectural historian Sibel Bozdoan describes it, as she describes it in Modernism and Nation Building, this processional alley which visually extends towards the Grand National Assembly and the Chankaya Hills, symbolizing the new seat of the modern secular republic. The axis, then, we might say, of the future. And the second axis, the axis of the mausoleum proper, which runs northeast to southwest, oriented rather towards Ulis and the city's ancient citadel, the axis of the past. The mausoleum itself, at the intersection of these two axes, occupies the place, not surprisingly, of the present. Despite a number of changes that occurred between conception and construction, the monument remains basically faithful to its designer's original vision of a Greek temple. The mausoleum itself is, in essence, an abstracted Parthenon. Like its Athenian counterpart, what we might call an octostyle, there are eight columns in the front, peripteral temple, that is, it's a central chamber surrounded by columns, with a naos, and the naos is a central chamber which traditionally, traditionally houses the temple's cult statue at its center. Enis Kotran, a professor of architecture and, at, uh, at Untu and student of Onats, classifies Anut Kabir in no uncertain terms as a peripteral temple and identifies the Parthenon as the primary model. Uh, this is Kotran, 
he says, um, Milatan önce 447'den 431'e kadar yollarında tasarlanıp gerçekleştirilmiş olan Atina'da Akrapolis üzerindeki Parthenon mabedi en tanınmış eserdir. Dolayısıyla Anıt Kabir de ona, excuse me, ona benzetilir. Unquote. My argument in any case does not depend on showing that Anıt Kabir is a precise or explicit imitation of that model. But within the larger context of an architectural movement and a cultural moment where classicism is regnant, the reference to the Parthenon would have been inevitable. And in the more immediate context of an architectural project of monumental proportions in the service of a national imaginary, it would have been, I think, in inescapable. But in this temple in the Hellenic manner, excuse me, but this temple in the Hellenic manner is grafted to a host of decorative elements deemed at once autochthonous, archaic, and ancestral. Heterogeneous forms of the past, including Seljuk and Ottoman elements that now appear to gesture proleptically towards the same homogeneously Turkish future. The processional alley, or Lion Road, as it is often referred to, is marked at its entrance by monumental sculptures in the Mesopotamian, or perhaps the National Socialist, mode, and lined with a succession of Hittite-style lion figures. Along the line of the second axis, flanking the stairs leading up to the mausoleum, are the so-called victory reliefs, which are bas-reliefs cast in a style that we may term faux prehistoric, depicting the great campaigns of the War of Independence. The subject and style of these reliefs serves to transform the events of recent history into heroic epic. Their message, <clears throat> their message seems to be clear. The battle for modernity is fought in Anatolia. And it is through the accumulation and association of heterogeneous archaic forms marked simultaneously as classical and Anatolian that the Parthenon is recuperated paradoxically as a piece of modern Turkish architecture. And this is a strategy uh, I think repeated throughout Anut Kabir, even in its most detailed ornamental features. Uh, just to give one example, uh, the portico of the colonnaded entrance to the mausoleum proper, or the Sherif Salonu, the Hall of Honor, is based upon Anatolian kilim motifs, but have which been realized in gold mosaic, which is a way uh, of I think classicizing folk art into high art and uh, a way of translating the local vernacular, we might say, into the classical lingua franca. Anut Kabir is, of course, part of a much larger program for building modernity, both from the top down and the bottom up. I refer here, of course, to the various cultural reforms launched both before and after the founding of the Republic, and which determined an entire architectural iconographic program the construction of monuments, concert halls, train stations, etc., etc. But it might also be argued that a similar program for nation building is already discernible in the ancient Athenian Parthenon. Both in Athens as in Ankara, architecture is part of a larger initiative, be it Periclean or Kemalist, designed to propagate a national imaginary, one that elides the boundaries between history and myth. The Athens, which produced the Parthenon, is, after all, an imperial state. Thirty years after its founding in 478, the so-called Delian League, the Association of Greek States, formed to defend against Persian, the Persian threat. That Delian League, 30 years later, has become, as Russell Meggs puts it in the Athenian Empire, an empire whose resources were no longer directed against Persia, but to the furtherance of Athenian policies at home and abroad. End of that quote. Pericles' ambitious building program, financed through the diversion of the reserve funds of the Delian treasury, is one of these policies situated at home, as Meigs puts it, but directed abroad. Indeed, in his own time, Pericles was criticized for the scope of this program and for the source of the funds used to implement it. These are the gestures, so the accusations go, of a new Athenian tyranny over Greece. And this is from Plutarch's Pericles. But that, says, Peric says Plutarch, but that which brought most delightful adornment 
to Athens, and the greatest amazement, amazement to the rest of mankind was no idle fiction. I mean his construction of sacred edifices. And this, more than all the public measures of Pericles, his enemies maligned and slandered. They cried out in the assemblies, the people has lost its fair fame and is in ill repute because it has removed the public monies of the Hellenes from Delos into its own keeping. And surely Hellas, Greece, is insulted with a dire insult and manifestly subjected to tyranny. Turanestai, that's the Greek, Turanestai, subjected to tyranny. When she sees that with her own enforced contributions for the war, we are gilding our city, which for all the world, like a wanton woman, adds to her wardrobe precious stones and costly statues and temples. That's from, Pericles, from uh, Plutarch's Pericles. Pericles' program, like Ataturk's, may be viewed as an effort to sacralize the sacred, excuse me, sacralize the secular, an effort which presupposes that the sacred has already been secularized. This is precisely Vincent Scully's point in his uh, famous study of Greek sacred architecture, the earth, the temple, and the gods. Scully views the Periclean complex on the Acropolis as a tightly integrated structure in which the relationship between buildings is, a, is as significant as the individual buildings themselves. Thus, the Parthenon and the, the Erechtheion, another building which sits across from it, appear to be engaged in a dialogue, a kind of agon between the sacred and the secular. It was the Erechtheion, after all, which some of you may know, it's the temple right next to the Parthenon, which has the famous Caryatids, row of Caryatids, instead of ordinary columns. It was that building, the Erechtheion, after all, like the earlier temple that stood in its place, which contained the wooden artifact, the Xoanon of Athena, which was the Acropolis's true sacred object. The temple of Athena Parthenos, the, the Parthenon, had its famous cult statue, of course, I'm talking about Phidias's colossal Chris Elephantine Athena, dedicated in 438, housed in the Naos, the Sella. But neither Pericles, Parthenon, nor the temples which stood earlier in its place ever housed an image conceived of as traditionally holy. The nucleus of the Parthenon, which is the Naos, comprised of two rooms back to back. There's the Sella, which housed the cult statue, and what's called the Apistodomos, the back room, which served as the treasury. All of this, this, this inner structure suggests, I think, the true nature of this temple, more secular than sacred. Athena herself, it has to be said, is, I think, a paradoxically secular deity. As Athena Polias, that was one of her epithets, Athena Polias, or protector of the city, Athena was, as Scully puts it, the goddess whom men enthroned in their citadels, and thus who represented the political life of the city." Unquote. Especially in classical Athens, Athena is transformed into the spirit of the polis itself. In Scully's words, again, the ancient goddess was remade into something that transcended religion as it had been conceived before. This is the classicist Scully. She was the victory of the city-state over everything." End quote. So the Acropolis complex is the visible statement of that transcendence. In it, the classical polis, as the essential vehicle for effective human action, is made a physically comprehensible fact. Visible, just like Anut Kabir, perched on Anutepe, from every quarter of the city, at least it used to be. Now the art on the Parthenon, the art adorning the Parthenon, has one primary function, to glorify the goddess and her city. The principal subject of the pediment at the front of the temple, the contest between Athena and Poseidon, represents the origin of the state as a mythic etion, an event outside of and constitutive of history. At the same time, the hegemony of a local or national Athenian identity is justified through its association with a larger heterogeneous Hellenic culture, which explains some of the other scenes, the triumphs of Lapiths over centaurs, Greeks over Trojans, as depicted in the Metopes around the temple. Scenes all of which point to the contemporary triumph of the Greeks over the Persians. <clears throat> 
But in Athens, as in Ankara, the old myths are replaced and revived by new political realities. Hence, the subject of the Parthenon Freeze, which is preparations for the Pan-Athenaic Festival, one of the most important municipal festivals of the city. According to John Boardman in Greek art, an unusual secular subject for the decoration of a temple. Scully, too, underscores the audaciousness of, as he puts it, the citizens of a Greek state placing themselves upon a frieze of a Greek temple. That the battle for modernity is fought by way of classical forms at Anut Kabir suggests an impulse at once then reactionary and revolutionary, and which we may identify as totalitarian in the Periclean mode. Regarding the classicism, the classicism on display at Anut Kabir, we may say precisely what Benjamin says of empire style in his essay Fourier or the Arcades, that it is, as he puts it, the style of revolutionary terrorism for which the state is an end in itself. In itself. What does Benjamin mean here? Now, Benjamin cites Jakob Falk on 18th century barns and stables built, says Falk, in the style of temples. And Benjamin concludes, there are thus masks of architecture. Masks of architecture. This is from the Arcades project. But what lies behind the mask, we're asking? Benjamin's answer, namely, the totalitarian fantasies of the nation, illuminates the function of the archaic and more specifically the classical style at Anut Kabir. This is Benjamin from the Arcades Project. Just as Napoleon failed to understand the functional nature of the state as an instrument of domination by the bourgeois class, so the architecture of his time failed to understand the functional nature of iron with which the constructive principle began its domination of architecture. This is a new material for building in the time of Napoleon. These architects, says Benjamin, design supports resembling Pompeian columns. The empire could only see then in this new technology, as Benjamin puts it, a revival of architecture in the classical Greek sense. New technology, old forms. What is at stake? at Anut Kabir is not the use or abuse of technology per se, but modernity itself. And Benjamin's point is that for better or worse, and usually worse, such modernity is imagined through the signs of the past. And not any past, the proto-past. The past safely relegated outside the domain of history. Let me put it this way, to sum up, to sum up Benjamin's thinking here. The most utopian impulses of an era are invariably expressed through the most archaic forms. I'll say that again. The most utopian, the utopian impulses of an era are invariably expressed through the most archaic forms. These archaic forms, Benjamin R argues, are the analog of what he calls images in the collective unconscious in which the old and the new penetrate. These images, this is part of a, long, a longer quote by Benjamin, these images are wish images. In them, the collective seeks to transfigure the immaturity of the social product. At the same time, says Benjamin, what emerges in these wish, wish images is the resolute effort to distance oneself from all that is antiquated, which includes, however, the recent past. These tendencies, this is still Benjamin, deflect the imagination which is given impetus by the new, back upon the primal past. In the dream in which each epoch entertains images of its successor, the latter appears wedded to elements of primal history, Urgeschichte. End of that quote. Each epoch, in the words of Michelet, as cited by Benjamin, each epoch dreams the one to follow, but it dreams in the forms of the primordial past. Anit Kabir, of course, is hardly the only building out of which such dreams are made. It is but one example of a classical revival, a la Turc, ascendant in the late 1930s and early 1940s, and which is sometimes referred to as the second national style. In this new architectural vernacular, 
Bozdoan, architectural historian, Sibel Bozdoan, discerns the abandonment of what she sees as the progressive international modernism of the early 1920s and 30s, what's sometimes called the, the first national style or the new architecture or sometimes also Ottoman revivalist architecture. Now in this, the influence, in this change, the influence of German architects is decisive. A pivotal moment is, for example, the opening of the new German architecture exhibition in Ankara in 1943, featured in the influential journal Architect, really the only architectural journal at that time, with photographs of Albert Speer's work and a speech by German architect Paul Bonatz, who also served on the jury of Anut Kabir, Paul Bonatz, attacking what he calls, Bonatz calls, avant-garde modernism, and endorsing instead, this is Bonatz, a modern interpretation of the classical. What Bonatz is advocating, in effect, is not classicism, but what I like to call fascism. Not fascism, but fascism. A national classical art, that's Bonatz's term. A national classical art, in which is enacted the triumph of the collective yet singular will of the nation. For Bonatz, this is a quote, the classical means the will to attain the final and the absolute. It means a distance from the fashions of the day and the whims of the individual. The art of construction, says Bonatz, will be carried out in the same way as politics. Not a multitude of meanings, but one singular meaning will be expressed. The deployment of the classical, then, enables the fascist monument to serve at once the interests of a narrow nationalism and an all-encompassing universalism to represent the collective will both of a people and all people. In this latter sense, that of all people, the classicism or fascism on display, I think, at Anut Kabir is final or absolute, as Bonatz calls it. It functions in totalitarian fashion as the only style, the last style, and thus the absence of all style. Now at this point, I want to invoke Benedict Anderson's framing of nationalism in imagined communities as a particular form of temporality. Nationalism for Anderson is less, we know, a coherent ideology than a secular form of religion, one which functions by situating the nation effectively outside of time or in time conceived of as pure continuity, what Benjamin, again, this time in Theses on the Philosophy of History, calls homogeneous or empty time. This is Anderson. If nation states are widely conceded to be new and historical, the nations to which they give political expression always loom out of an immemorial past and still more important, glide into a limitless future." End of quote. Now at this point, at this juncture, Anderson offers in a footnote two examples. One is Sukarno's use of the term Indonesia to refer to a pre-Indonesian past, and the second is Ataturk's attribution of a Hittite and Sumerian prehistory to the new Turkish state. It's the only time in imagined communities where Turkey or Ataturk is mentioned. These translations of myth into history, like the translation of classicism into architecture at Anut Kabir, represents what Benjamin in the theses calls the historicist as opposed to the historical materialist approach to the past basically historicist, bad, historical materialist, good. For architectural historian Afife Batur, uh, Anut Kabir offers a design, what he calls, beyond style and outside of time. Uslup ötesi ve zaman dışı bir tasarım. A perfect statement of the historicist and what I've been calling fascist position. The historical materialist, on the other hand, knows that history unfolds, as Benjamin puts it, not in homogeneous, empty time, but time filled by the presence of the now, the jetztzeit, as Benjamin calls it, the now time. At this point in his theses, Benjamin cites Robespierre's cynical appropriation of the symbols of ancient Rome. Here, it would seem, in Robespierre, was a man who understood all too well the revolutionary potential of historical materialism and who understood, too, the enormous profits to be reaped from the exploitation of the classical past. And um, this is Benjamin. To Robespierre, ancient Rome was a past charged with the time of the now, which he blasted out of the continuum of history. The French Revolution viewed itself as Rome incarnate, 
It evoked ancient Rome the way fashion evokes costumes of the past. On end of that quote. One is reminded here of the masks of architecture evoked in the arcades project earlier. But in the case of Robespierre, the mask is a cynical ploy, a prop in the service of real politique. Anit Kabir, on the other hand, wears its mask with deadly seriousness. It believes in the history it projects. The historical materialist, on the other hand, can only view Anit Kabir and other what are called cultural treasures, which is Benjamin's term for the hallowed monuments of a nation, can only view such things with what he calls cautious detachment, as objects designed to disguise the very labor which brought them into existence. Contrast this cult cautious detachment with classicist Scully's apology, which is neither cautious nor detached, for, again, the Parthenon, which he says this about. The human participant in antiquity, as now, this is Scully on someone looking at the Parthenon, the human participant in antiquity, as now, must have felt an emotion most rare, a sense of conquest without folly or guilt. Must be nice to feel that. You know. This was the exact realization of Pericles' program, says Scully, the solitary expression in human art of total victory. The historical materialist rescues the ruin from the eternal image of the past. That's Benjamin's term. The classicist, on the other hand, assigns it a position outside of time. This is Scully, again, on the Parthenon. The observer can only be aware that time stops in this classical art. That's what people always say about classical art. Time stops in this classical art. There is only being and light. It's a nice phrase, but I, I have absolutely no idea what it means. But it sounds, it sounds beautiful. Now, empty time goes hand in hand with empty space. One might compare Anut Kabir to the cenotaphs and tombs of unknown soldiers that serve as Anderson's emblems, famous emblems of nationalism in imagined communities. This is Anderson. Yet void as these tombs are of identifiable remains or immortal souls, they are nonetheless saturated, says Anderson, with ghostly national imaginings. Now, at first, I admit the comparison seems wrong, since Anut Kabir was built expressly to be Ataturk's mausoleum. We know who's there. But surely, Anderson's cenotaphic logic is equally at work in the, to in the tombs of soldiers that we know. For isn't it the case, I ask, that the bodies of the dead and the structures they inhabit are always saturated with ghostly imaginings? Isn't every tomb a cenotaph? And when the body inside is that of a fallen hero, the founder of a nation, then those imaginings are necessarily both ghostly and national. The body laid to rest at Anut Kabir is not simply some body then, but any body. It is the Turkish body politic. Now, since 1973, it's true, of course, Anut Kabir has also been the residence of Izmet Inonu, whose tomb in the West Arcade directly faces the Ataturk mausoleum on the opposite side of the ceremonial plaza. Of course, it's hard to resist comparing the two structures in size and stature, but surely Inanu is there to remind us that there is no comparison, that Ataturk is the incomparable. By the terms of the national imaginary, there can be only one body politic. By the very same terms, however, that body must be abstracted, made invisible, made to be somehow there, yet not there. Hence, the logic of the cenotaph kicks in, which compels us to resurrect, to summon up the spirit of the departed repeatedly, ritually. And if this logic operates so effectively at Anut Kabir, that is because it is also, to be technical, a cenotaph in a real sense. That is, Ataturk's body does not, in fact, as we know, inhabit the sarcophagus, which stands in the Hall of Honor. It lies below in the tomb room, Anit Kabir's true cella or sanctum sanctorum, and which is generally closed to the public. Same thing for Inunus remains, which are similarly interred in a crypt beneath the sarcophagus.
The visitor to Anut Kabir is therefore required to pay his or her respects before a symbolic tomb to replenish, to replenish that which is in fact empty. It is by this continual process of emptying out and replenishment that the nation can perpetually reproduce itself. Such infinite reproducibility being for Anderson, that's Anderson's term, infinite reproducibility, being the defining characteristic of the nation. The nation is only truly possible to connect the dots leading back again to Benjamin in the age of mechanical reproduction. And yet, the emptying out, the hollowing, the hollowing out of that aura, to invoke Benjamin again, begins long before the advent of the modern nation. Consider the already drastic depreciation of the Greek gods, which is the subject of Lucian's Zeus Tragodos, Zeus, tragic Zeus, a second century satirical dialogue. In this dialogue, Zeus, just a brief interlude and then uh, I'll be concluding. In this satirical dialogue, Zeus bids Hermes to assemble the gods upon Olympus, and this is now Lucian, to seat each of them, to sit down each of them, in his proper place according to his material and workmanship. In other words, the gods are now seen as statues. Right? That's how they're referred to. And this is, again, Zeus speaking to Hermes. Those of gold in the front row, then next to them those of silver, then those of ivory, then those of bronze or stone. But material and workmanship are not necessarily linked. A statue in bronze may be, as Hermes points out, far superior to one in gold, artistically speaking. In which case, Zeus clarifies, gold will trump bronze every time, no matter how good the statue is. I understand, says Hermes, and this is a quote now from Lucian, you tell me to seat them, the gods, in order of wealth, not in order of merit. Come to the front, seat, come to the front seats then, you gods of gold. It is likely, Zeus, that none but foreigners will occupy the front row. For as to the Greeks, you yourself see what they are like. Attractive, to be sure, and artistically made, but all of marble or bronze or ivory, with just a little gleam of gold, merely to the extent of being superficially tinged and brightened, while within, even these are of wood, and shelter whole droves of mice. In other words, they're empty. They shelter whole families of mice that keep court inside. And I'm going to get back to this verb, that keep court inside, the verb empolitovmenos, empoliteovmenos. I'll get back to that in just a second. So, all that glitters is indeed not gold. Already in Lucian's time in the second century AD, it would appear that divinity has become a rather hollow affair. And note too that Lucian's image of mice taking up residence, empoliteomenos, in the interior of statues also implicates the polis and the virtues of citizenship therein in this process of depreciation and deception and decay. The verb empoliteomenos means literally to be a citizen of a polis. Now we know that Phidias's colossal cult statue, this Chris Elephantine gold and ivory statue for the Parthenon, was indeed supported by a wooden armature at the center of which was a hollow shaft driven deep into the base. We know from, Pera from Plutarch that the Athena Parthenos, this statue, was in fact inlaid with a thin layer of ivory and gold plates. And we know from Pausanias that Lacaris, tyrant of Athens, stripped the statue of its gold in 296. It would seem then that a cenotaphic logic is already detectable in the institution of the sacred in classical Athens. Now the full implications of that logic perhaps are only evident with the rise of the modern nation state. Anderson asks us to consider for a moment the sudden interest in ancient monuments in colonial states in the 19th century. This new monumental archaeology, Anderson suggests, allowed the state to appear as the guardian of a generalized but also local tradition with a capital T. It was not surprisingly, says Anderson, increasingly linked to tourism. 
Hence, the, what I call the museumification of these sacred relics of the pre-colonial past, which were thereby, in Anderson's terms, repositioned as regalia, symbols, regalia, for a secular colonized state. The neutralization of the sacred relic is thus a decisive factor in that infinite reproducibility, which Anderson sees as one of the essential features of the new profane nation state. And thus what follows is a vast, as Anderson puts it, logoization, a logoization made possible by the technologies of print and technology, which now becomes the order of the day from postage stamps to postcards to textbooks, all disseminating images of the once sacred monuments of the past. And yet, logoization itself surely is a mechanism for redistributing the sacred for the colonial states de-sanctification, de-sanctification of originally sacred objects goes hand in hand as we might expect with its sanctific sanctification excuse me, of previously secular objects. Both processes I think are clearly visible in the logoization of Anut Kabir and of course Ataturk himself. Which brings me at last to the conclusion and also to the title of this paper from Umberto Eco's Travels in Hyperreality. Echoes America is a nation obsessed with realism and the perfect likeness. Examples of this hyper-realism range from the wax reproductions of the Mona Lisa and the Venus de Milo at the Palace of Living Arts in Los Angeles, examples of pure kitsch, to the more erudite, detailed reconstructions of Roman villas at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Malibu. But other periods echoes, sorry, echoes, I was going to say echoes echo. Other periods, argues echo, resolved the problem differently. This is echo. We try to think how a Roman patrician lived and what he was thinking when he built himself one of the villas that the Getty Museum reconstructs. This is still echo. The Roman yearned for impossible Parthenons. From Hellenistic artists, he ordered copies of the great statues of the Periclean Age." Unquote. The strategy on display at the Getty is a typically American one, at least as viewed from a typically European perspective, suggesting, in Echo's terms, how the European past can be re-experienced in a country which, with much future but no historical reminiscence. Right? This is typical American, European on, on America, a place with no history. Anut Kabir's strategy, on the other hand, is that of a country, we might say, with too much memory, with too much history. It follows that Turkey's efforts to reconstruct the past will be radically different than America's. They yearn for impossible but very different Parthenons. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Very lively paper. Happy to take questions, questions. comments. There is always a, a certain period of silence. <laughs> I always think you, you have to let things percolate to the surface. It's like you know, waiting for the coffee to boil. From Kriklis to Atatürk. <laughs> I was, I was just wondering, you know, we are living in a, in a geographical place in the world that uh, there's a lot of Hellenistic ruins in, in, in this country, as you know, from coming from the Alexandrian period, maybe more than 2,000 ancient towns which almost have their own, you know, temples and things like that. So if I look in a general sense, I, I don't see any, any other type of big monumental uh, architectural relics, even if we in include the periods of the Selchuks and the Ottomans and others. So I, I'm just thinking that, you know, would these people have, could, could these people have any other choice to, uh, to, 
to to go forward to you know to reconstruct a, a monumental stop type of thing because after all you know it was probably the the, the only primordial form of uh, temple that they could observe in this part of the uh, of the world i was just you know assuming something can you can you just comment sure yeah i mean I, I mean i think i have to uh, you know disagree respectfully with the the premise there uh, i mean uh, you know turkey is punctuated and populated with relics from not just the Hellenistic or, or classical or archaic period, but you know there are there are a wealth of Hittite monuments. Go to Hattushash. There are uh, enormous quantities of Seljuk and Ottoman monuments that, that serve uh, you know beyond their 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 physical presence as powerful symbolic reminders of of all sorts of different kinds of pasts. And I mean, don't take it from my from my word. I mean the as I mentioned, in, in, the, in the original contest in which artists submitted possible plans for Anut Kabir, um, you know, the Greek temple was only one of a whole range of, of possible architectural icons that served as, as models for, um, for a potential mausoleum. So again, there were architects, some of them Turkish, some of them Western, who entered into the competition, who offered us Egyptian, essentially Egypto-style pyramids, Seljuk type monuments, Ottoman style, Turbe, uh, Turbeler, uh, you know, and, and even, even sort of modernist um, sort of geometric forms in the, in the style of Ledoux. You know, so you have, in fact, a whole possible range of architectural uh, sort of idiolects that could have been employed. And uh, the choice of the, the, the Hellenic as the primary model was by no means uncontested. And it's interesting, um, in the original plan, which I, I read from, in which the, the Greek temple was clearly the model for Anut Kabir, was followed by a revised plan submitted in concert with the jury and various committees, submitted by Onat and Arda, in which the Seljuk and the Ottoman became much more dominant as, as, the, as the vernacular. So in fact, the Anit Kabir, Kabir that we know was almost not built as it, as it, as it is today. Uh, and then Onat and Arda went back in their, in, in, their, in their final plan to the original proposal in which the, the, the classical or the Hellenic dominates. But thank you for the, the question. I have a question. <laughs> Please. Uh, I was just keeping my question. Uh, I wanted to be the last one, but uh, <laughs> I hope I'm not the last one. <laughs> Maybe it'll, it'll, it'll yeah. inspire others to follow in your wake. You know, at some moment, uh, I mean, you, you referred to Benjamin throughout your paper, Matthew, but uh, at some moment, um, you, you made a kind of comparison between um, Benjamin's yet site and, and this, uh, this kind of um, um, nation building, uh, you know, uh, search for some sort of primordial form or whatever. Uh, but both of these, since you referred to Benjamin's passage on Robespierre and French Revolution, uh, you know, um, taking up the old costumes, the, Ro the Roman Republic, etc. How how do you can you open this a little bit uh, more? Uh, like how do you see the difference between? Yeah. This kind of, um, you know, return to the past and you know yes. borrowing from the past, yes. and what Benjamin means by yet sight mm -hmm. and uh, and that kind of that other supposedly other kind of borrowing from the past. I mean, how, how do you see? Is there a difference or a, uh, yeah? yeah or how that, do you see that? That yeah. could be a confusing point. Uh, I mean, I mean the key is that you know the yet sight as Benjamin uses it in theses on history, uh, on the philosophy of history is is engaged already in the domain of realpolitik, right? It's about power. It's an understanding that history is always involved and imbricated with, with real people, with forces that involve uh, contestation and power and suffering. So, so and now this is, this is an understanding of the past that can be used either re in reactionary or revolutionary 
terms, just as Benjamin would say media, the new media like cinema or photography can be used either for reactionary or revolution, revolutionary purposes. Uh, Robespierre's appropriation of the symbols and emblems of the classical past, particularly Rome, is for, is for Benjamin an example of someone who understands historical materialism, who understands realpolitik, but is using it, unfortunately, for tyrannical and ultimately terrifying purposes. If we think of the, the, the origins of the word terrorism in the, the French Revolution as the terror. So, ben, so in other words, Robespierre has the right idea, but, but is using it for the wrong, for the wrong reasons. Uh, this kind of this kind of historical materialism is not what's happening. I'm arguing at Anut Kabir. Anut Kabir is an example of a full-on, deadly serious historicist building, which takes seriously the history it projects. And this is an example of that no, that kind of history that Benjamin calls homogeneous or empty time. But it believes in the eternity of the Turkish nation, even if one understands that the nation is a historical product of modernity. Still, it looks back to primordial roots and looks ahead to a kind of utopian future. So this is not an example. I don't see, you know, at Anit Kabir, a sense of the yetzt um, it's, 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 a, it's a vision of modernity that instead is, is in, sense, in some sense reactionary. That is moving, it looks ahead to the utopian future through forms that are in fact archaic and primordial. Does that help to, yeah, sure. to clarify? Yeah, because, uh, yeah, that it does. Thank you for allowing me to talk about that more because it's an interesting question, I think. Yes? Um, I was wondering uh, whether we're kind of transcending the sense of uh, this um, the hero as subject uh, for Ataturk, since uh, you know uh, the leaders have uh, been inhabiting in Dolma uh for the last several years, because uh, I mean that I I'm just wondering if, in your terms, Anit Kabir as a mausoleum mm -hmm. has a different sense now that it it is still inhabitable as a zone, because I mean if we talk about zones of inhabitation, those zones still are have their primordial values and. Uh, have still their symb symbolic values in terms of the nationalist ideology and people can still still cling on it. At least, you know, certain parts of the population or certain yes, ideology yes. holding people. Yes. Uh, so now that Dolma Bahce is uh, sort of a more open and flexible um, uh, habitable zone, uh, does the mausoleum, uh, Anit Kabir, the, uh, as the mausoleum, have a different significance? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a good question. Uh, you know, and, and that's, you know, if one, one were to, if, if one were to extend this kind of study, one would want to position what's happening at Anit Kabir with other pseudo-sacred monuments and sites, and I think you're right to point out the differences between uh, Anit Kabir and Dolma Bache. Dolma Bache, of course, has with it, uh, it, it's a touristic site, but which of course carries with it a certain, a certain venerable, you know, sacred sense of, of its role. You know, of course, the visit to Ataturk's deathbed, uh, the visit of school children, uh, you know, uh, taking off their shoes as if they're in someone's home. Uh, all of that suggests that Dolma Bache itself plays a very significant role in, let's say, the the, the maintenance or the sustained, the, the sustaining of a, of a Turkish national imaginary. But I think you're absolutely right, to, if, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, to, to focus on the notion of habitation at An Anit Kabir. Uh, Anit Kabir was distinguished from its very conception, and it, you know, we, it wasn't built until 1955, right? Because of the war, it didn't get built, but it was from its very conception to its current uh, functioning in the, in, in the rituals of the state, it was seen as the place where Ataturk would rest. And so, uh, yes, it draws its power in a very, very, I think, very uh, clear way from the, the, the fact that, that we know Ataturk is there. And I would compare it, I would compare it to the role uh, that um, you mentioned the term of heroes, Ataturk as a hero. And I mean, I go back to the ancient the Greek notion of the hero. And this reminds me of the function that the body of the, of the hero played after death 
so often in ancient Greek epic or Greek tragedy. I'm talking about, for exa example, um, if you, those of you who know, you know Greek tragedy, for example, the, the, the scene between Orestes and Electra at the tomb of Agamemnon in the second play of the Oresteia, the, the libation bearers, where they're, they're present at the tomb of Agamemnon, who's, who's there, and from that tomb they gather their strength and sort of re re-sacralize their mission, which is, a, which is a terrible mission, the mission that, that they will have to kill Clytemnestra. Uh, I think also of the body of Oedipus after death, where Oedipus, this, this criminal, this monster, this, this, who's seen as tainted uh, by his sins, uh, in life, after death, in the play Oedipus at Colonus by Socrates, uh, Socrates, uh, Sophocles, in that play, Oedipus's body confers upon the place where it's buried a magical, protective, defensive force against all invaders. So it's very significant, even though Oedipus is from Thebes, he's buried in Colonus, which is on the outskirts of Athens. Again, we're back, every Greek tragedy, of course, is again about the polis and the power, and not just any polis, tragedy is about the Athenian polis. So here is this myth, a myth of monstrous transgression against the gods and against the sacred, but in death, Oedipus's body becomes the site, the sacred force which will protect Athens against all invasion. And I really think, in some ways, the uh, you know the, the the body of the hero at Anit Kabir plays that kind of magical, mythic, defensive uh, role in some sense. I could go on, but I better stop. You get to say when. You, you're, you're, the, you're the, I'm not the, I'll just sit here until someone has a question if, you know, I don't mind. <laughs> well, thank you. Anything else? <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> exactly, we have to, it, Time to visit, revisit it again. Thank you. Very much. Thank, you. Thank you. My pleasure.